I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare, Series 2, Podcast G, Measure for Measure. Measure for Measure is one of Shakespeare's greatest plays. Unfortunately, it is also one of his most often mistreated by critics. The good characters have been attacked as problematic and disturbing, and the themes have been obscured by the failure to read the play as a renaissance rather than a modern drama. I am going to try to make clear what Shakespeare is actually accomplishing in this great and serious comedy. Seen properly, it is as deep, uplifting, and healing as anything Shakespeare had previously written. Anyone who has raised children, run a business, joined an organization, taught school, or lived in any way among people knows that one of the greatest challenges of leadership is to govern with both justice and mercy. The reason is that these two great principles of the moral life are paradoxical opposites. Justice is the principle by which we hold all human beings who are endowed with free will to the unalterable standards of human behavior. To choose to break one of these absolute standards is to open oneself up to retribution and correction, by which justice restores the condition of harmony in the soul and in society. However, since all human beings are fallible and endlessly prone to error, there is an equal and opposite principle that offers the human maker of mistakes a path away from despair, namely the principle of mercy. For, as Portia says in The Merchant of Venice, Act 4, Scene 1, Lines 199 to 202, in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. There is a difficulty, however. Perfect justice and perfect mercy are mutually exclusive. A parent cannot both punish his child for stealing and look the other way. A ruler cannot both justly put a thief in jail and mercifully let him off the hook. Neither can we pick only one of these principles and safely ignore the other. A parent who justly punishes his child for every infraction, whatever the circumstances, will rear either a fearful wet noodle or a rebel against all rules. A parent who mercifully gives his child a pass, no matter what nastiness has been committed, will rear an antisocial egotist. Likewise, if a leader rules only by justice, none of us would be found free of error and punishments would be constant. But if the leader rules only by mercy, the lack of fear of just punishment invites multiplication of crimes and society topples. This is what Aeschylus, in Measure for Measure, at Act 2, Scene 1, Line 284, means by pardon is still, meaning always, the nurse of second woe. Hence, the paradoxical condition and question of every ruler. How can one rule with both justice and mercy? Over thousands of years, Judeo-Christian civilization, acknowledging the paradox, has established a principle for resolving it. Justice must be tempered with mercy. Or, in Portia's words at Act 4, Scene 1, Lines 196-197 to 197 of The Merchant of Venice, Earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. Tempering, seasoning, modification of justice with mercy, the right measure of each. It's a great solution but a difficulty remains. How does one rule in this particular case? When is the specific offender to be put into jail, and when is he to be let off with a warning? Does it depend on the severity of the crime, the specifics of the crime, the offender's attitude, mitigating circumstances? All of these considerations enter into the deliberations of a judge loyal to both justice and mercy. No judge but God could ever achieve perfection in the challenge to temper justice with mercy. Judges, too, are fallible. But that proper tempering must be every judge's goal. And the degree to which that goal is achieved depends on the wisdom and the character of the judge. 
The challenge is particularly acute when it comes to erotic matters, because eros is one of the most powerful forces at work in human beings, all human beings. And though it involves us in the most private and intimate of interactions, its universality makes it also one of the most potentially positive and negative forces subject to choice and error in the life of a community and of a state. Hence, a state must have laws governing erotic activity. And like the parent, the state and society may stray too far to one side or the other. One state may busy itself too much with sitting in judgment on the most intimate details of bedroom behavior. Another may permit such license that bigamy, adultery, rape, incest, and sexual trafficking go unpunished. But even in a state characterized by a well-balanced legal system, when the justice of reasonable laws runs up against the overwhelming power of erotic desire, to which every man and woman may become subject at one time or another, even a wise judge is especially challenged. Women must be protected from predatory men, and the city must be protected from the corruptions of prostitution and venereal disease. That requires justice. At the same time, like all men, the judge himself is subject to erotic desire, and therefore ought to be disposed toward mercy about the sexual behavior of others. How is a judge to temper justice with mercy in governing a city rife with sexual misbehavior? This is the subject of Measure for Measure. In dramatizing it, Shakespeare universalizes the principle underlying the behavior of the wise judge and shows us what it might look like when, in the words of Psalm 85, verse 10, mercy and truth have met, righteousness and peace have kissed. Duke Vincentio is beloved. He has ruled with mercy for many years. I'll address later in note 6 the problem of the exact number of years. The result of his mercy is that Vienna is teeming with corruption, particularly sexual corruption. Brothels, venereal diseases, irresponsible fathers of children born out of wedlock, and sexual harassment by the powerful. Sound familiar? Under Vincentio's leadership, Vienna has drifted too far to the mercy side, and as the play opens, he has decided to see the city corrected. In order to accomplish this goal, he puts Angelo in charge and announces that he himself is leaving town. Why does he choose Angelo? Angelo, whose name implies messenger of God, has a reputation for virtue, in particular for absolute sexual self-control. As the Duke's deputy, he will begin enforcing the old laws again and rein in the city's self-indulgent corruptions represented in the witty depravities of Lucio, whose name in Latin means visible light, implying, in a pun that works in English for those who know the meaning of the Latin, morally light, as opposed to serious. Angelo begins by arresting Claudio for getting his fiancée, Juliet, pregnant before they are married. The law decrees that the punishment is death and Angelo is determined to make an example of Claudio for the rest of Vienna. Compare this decision with Aeschylus's initially merciful treatment of Pompey at Act 2, Scene 1, lines 244-251, where he lets him off with a warning. But why, asked the critics, doesn't the Duke just get strict himself, instead of having Angelo do the dirty work for him? He himself tells us why, at Act 1, Scene 3, Lines 35 to 39. Sith, meaning since t'was my fault to give the people scope, t'would be my tyranny to strike and gall them for what I bid them do. For we bid this be done when evil deeds have their permissive pass and not the punishment. If we permit evil to go unpunished, it is as if we are promoting the evil. That being so, it would be cruel to let the people misbehave without punishment and then suddenly begin enforcing the laws. The Duke then says a few lines later 
that Angelo will strike home in his, the duke's, name. And yet my nature never in the fight to do in slander. This is a crucial point often misunderstood. It is not for his own sake that the duke wants to keep the people from disliking him. It is for the sake of the city and the people that he must protect his image from being abused. We later see Lucio engaging in just such abuse, in his case totally groundless slander, and risking severe punishment for it. It is for the good of the whole that the duke chooses to let the famously upright Angelo do the punishing in his name. If anything goes wrong, the duke will be there in disguise to fix it, and he will do so without losing the respect and obedience of the people, without which, as Shakespeare and his audience believed, Cities and states fall into chaos, and everyone suffers. In King John, Richard II, Julius Caesar, King Lear, and other plays, Shakespeare illustrates this consequence of the loss of faith in one's prince. The Duke has another reason for putting Angelo in charge. He wants to test him. In this, he is reenacting several parables in the New Testament, in which a lord gives orders, leaves, and returns later to judge how his orders have been followed. As the duke knows, but we find out only later, despite Angelo's reputation for virtue, he has in fact been guilty of breach of promise toward his own fiancée, Mariana. He called off the wedding because her dowry was lost at sea, but pretended it was because she was unchaste. She wasn't. So as the Duke says to Friar Thomas at Act 1, Scene 3, Lines 53 to 54, Hence shall we see, if power change purpose, what our seemers be. That is, we will see whether Angelo's new power over others will reveal fallibility in himself. And then the Duke puts on the disguise of a Franciscan friar and sticks around to watch what happens. It is a profound, intentional irony of the play that Angelo and Claudio are precise foils for one another. Claudio jumps into bed with Juliet before their marriage is solemnized. Angelo abandons Mariana before their marriage is solemnized. Claudio is possessed by lust, Angelo by greed. Both betray the union of man and woman, of body and soul, of lower and higher, that is the essence of sacramental marriage, Claudio by too soon embracing his beloved, and Angelo by failing to embrace his and abandoning her instead. Both come under the threat of death for their sins, and both find mercy in the justice of the Duke. Angelo and Claudio are not the only ones tested in the play. Isabel is preparing to become a nun. The Vienna of Lucio and Mistress Overdone has become inhospitable for a virtuous maid, and she wishes to join the sisters of St. Clair, known to be the most restrictive of the orders of nuns, specifically because she desires a more strict restraint, as she says at Act 1, Scene 4, Line 4. When Lucio, the emissary of the world of self-indulgence, comes to ask her to plead with Angelo for her brother's life, she is at first humbly diffident, doubting her own power to help. Alas, what poor abilities in me to do him good, she says at Act 1, Scene 4, Line 75 to 76. But in response to Lucio's persuasion, she agrees to do what she can. And as Claudio has told us at Act 1, Scene 2, Lines 184 to 186, Isabel is good at reasoning, discourse, and persuasion. The test comes when, overcome by lust for Isabel, lust that has been ignited by the very fact of her virtue, Angelo offers to free her brother if she will permit Angelo to possess her sexually. Some have found Isabel hard-hearted in refusing to do so. What's a little act of sex when your brother's life is at stake? But for the virtuous Isabel, there is no such thing as a little act of sex. For her, 
sexual intercourse is either sacramentally justified by marriage or mortal sin. At Act 1, Scene 4, Line 47, she first reacts to her brother's sexual sin with Juliet by saying, Oh, let him marry her. That would redeem Claudio's haste in going to bed with his fiancée before the wedding. But were Isabel to surrender her body to Angelo willingly, she would be burdening her soul with what she believes to be a damnable sin. This is what she means when she says, at Act 2, Scene 4, lines 106 to 108, and line 185, Better it were a brother died at once than that a sister, by redeeming him, should die forever, meaning be damned. And, more than our brother is our chastity. She is not being a prude, as she is accused of being by some critics. She is concerned about the condition, and therefore the eternal fate, of her own immortal soul and of her brother's. When, in Act 3, Scene 1, Isabel tells her brother of Angelo's offer, Claudio's first response at line 102 is quick and noble, as she expects it to be. Thou shalt not do it. We know it is quick, because his words complete the pentameter line she has begun. But then, succumbing in selfish weakness to the fear of hell and damnation, at lines 117 to 131, Claudio joins Angelo in asking Isabel to give in to Angelo so that Claudio's life may be prolonged. This she experiences as a violent attack not just on her body, but on her soul. First Angelo, and now her own brother, ask her to risk damnation for their own benefits. For Angelo, the satisfaction of lust. For Claudio, a life of selfishness. In response to this attack, Isabel is rightly outraged and condemns her brother for his weakness and injustice to her. As they turn out, events totally justify Isabel's decision. The deal would not in fact have won Claudio's life. Angelo, thinking he has slept with Isabel, sends word that Claudio should be killed immediately, lest Claudio seek revenge later for being given life at the cost of his sister's chastity. As the poet Philip Thompson writes, Doesn't anyone notice that by afflicting Claudio with justice, Isabella makes him a just man? When the play's action is concluded, ask Claudio if he resents his sister's passion for purity. The end of the play is one of the most moving scenes in all Shakespeare's work. Isabel, who has argued so eloquently for mercy in Act 2, now appears in Act 5, Scene 1, Line 25, calling for justice, 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 justice. Yet before the end of the scene, once Angelo is caught, penitent, and harmless, she kneels to beg mercy for him, her worst enemy. So far from being cold-hearted or prudish as some critics have accused her of being, she has in fact responded to every situation confronting her with the particular virtue called for, justice, kindness, self-sacrifice, righteous indignation, patience, mercy, and forgiveness. The Duke, too, has embodied all the virtues of a both righteous and merciful leader, and his alternating costumes represent his successful effort to temper justice with mercy. He is dressed as the embodiment of love and mercy when wearing the robe of a Franciscan friar, and dressed as the embodiment of justice itself when he reappears in his ducal attire. In the final scene he appears in both costumes. As he has told us himself at Act 3, Scene 2, lines 261-262, to 262, He who the sword of heaven will bear should be as holy as severe. The sword of heaven is the power of the ruler, the deputy of God, to dispense justice, even to the point of executing a criminal. That severity must be tempered with holiness, that is, mercy, behavior comporting with the Christian ideal of loving even one's enemies. In this tempering of justice with mercy, Angelo has failed. Early on, at Act 2, Scene 1, lines 29 to 30, Angelo has said, 
When I that censure him do so offend, let mine own judgment pattern out my death. Once he is caught, he remains true to that merciless principle, even when it is applied to himself. Let my trial be mine own confession. Immediate sentence then and sequent death is all the grace I beg. And I crave death more willingly than mercy. Tis my deserving, and I do entreat it, says Angelo at Act 5, Scene 1, lines 372 to 374, and lines 476 to 477. By contrast, the action of the play's final scene exhibits the Duke's great triumph in tempering justice with mercy. He first sees to it that Angelo confesses, marries Mariana, and recognizes the justice in his impending execution. Similarly, he pronounces upon Lucio the verdicts of marriage to correct his fornication, and whipping and hanging to punish his slandering of his prince. But once Isabel passes the test of her capacity to have mercy on her justly condemned enemy, the duke tempers his own justice with mercy toward Angelo. Then he shows mercy even to his own slanderer Lucio. Thus, the double values of justice and mercy are achieved. The corruption of Vienna is corrected and its villains are redeemed without loss of life. At Act 4, Scene 3, Lines 70 to 71, this wisdom of the Duke's tempering is confirmed by heaven, which has provided the death by cruel fever of the most notorious pirate Ragazine, whose head is sent to Angelo in place of Claudio's, so that even Barnardine, who is unfit to live or die, as we hear at Act 4, Scene 3, Line 64, is mercifully spared, also to be acquitted of all his earthly faults by the Duke. That's at Act 5, Scene 1, Line 483. But why does the Duke allow Isabel to believe that her brother is dead when we know he is not? Isn't this cruel? We must remember that the Duke is not an equal misbehaving toward an equal. He is the rightful ruler and Isabel his subject, and he tells us the reason at Act 4, Scene 3, Lines 109 to 111, if only we will believe it. He says, But I will keep her ignorant of her good, to make her heavenly comforts of despair when it is least expected. That is, to turn her despair into unexpected joy. It is by virtue of this decision of the Duke that the final scene becomes not only an enactment of justice tempered with mercy in the worldly realm, but a prefiguring of the harmony of heaven in which justice and mercy and their tempering are one. That the Duke is a representative of the divine government of the world is made explicit in the words of Angelo at Act 5, Scene 1, lines 366 to 370. O oh, my dread Lord, I should be guiltier than my guiltiness to think I can be undiscernible when I perceive your grace, like power divine, hath looked upon my passes, meaning trespasses. In the testing of Isabel, as in the testing of Angelo, the Duke is not arrogantly playing at being God. He is enacting a parable. His testing of his subjects is an image of God's testing of all men. Challenged to beg for mercy for her enemy Angelo, even though she believes he has killed her brother, Isabel enacts a triumph of Christian love and proves the excellence of her character. The reward for that act of mercy is immediate. The living Claudio is produced, thanks to the foresight of the Duke and the loyalty of the Provost, and Isabel experiences on earth a reunion of precisely the kind that she believes awaits all saved souls in heaven, and a resurrection of precisely the kind that she believes awaits all saved souls at the end of earthly time. Thus this realistic drama of human beings, who might well have lived in such a time and place as Shakespeare makes of Vienna, becomes also a parable of the right relation between love and sex, between justice and mercy, between state and the individual human being. It provides an image of how, under a just and merciful ruler, virtue, the tempering of justice with mercy, is rewarded on earth as it is in heaven. 
remembering the concepts of hierarchy and correspondence we discussed in Chapter 7 of Series 1, we will see in the Duke here not only a just and merciful man and ruler, but the embodiment in parable of the relation of God to his world. The play ends with a proposal of marriage, which must be understood to be accepted by Isabel's moved silence. There have been directors who cause Isabel to storm off in a huff, as they might just as wrongly cause Catherine to do at the end of The Taming of the Shrew, because she feels abused, imposing a misleading modern agenda upon Shakespeare's play. But such a gesture destroys the entire thematic point of the drama. The Vienna, from whose corruption Isabel was in retreat, has been corrected thanks to the Duke's wisdom and action. Justice and mercy are united within Isabel and within the Duke. And now, the two best human beings in Vienna will be united to one another. Instead of becoming, in a Catholic sense, a bride of Christ by becoming a nun, Isabel becomes the bride of God's deputy on earth, fulfilling both her spiritual and her mortal callings in a sacramental marriage that figures the union of the redeemed soul with God. In fact, as Philip Thompson has noted, the Duke and Isabel are of one mind both committed with their whole selves to virtue, to justice when it is called for, to mercy when it is called for, and to their ultimate harmony under the government of the world by God and under the government of the city by God's virtuous deputy on earth. Their marriage is the embodied wedding of justice and mercy. Now I'm going to address eight key lines of the play. After discussing them, I will offer ten specific notes to help you in your reading. 1. Lines 19, 44, and 65 of the first scene of the play present us with three versions of one antithesis. Terror and love, mortality and mercy, and force and qualify. The Duke in all three of these lines alludes to the same antithesis, justice and mercy, the theme of the play. The parallelism of mortality and mercy in Vienna live in thy tongue and heart is that the power to execute a man, justice, lies in the tongue of the ruler, who can speak the words off with his head, and the power to mitigate that punishment or qualify the law requiring it arises from his heart's capacity to experience mercy. 2. The humor in Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 50 and following and in the other elbow scenes, depends, among other things, upon our recognizing the malapropism in elbow's speech. Though he is a good man, he has a shaky grasp of English vocabulary, and often unintentionally substitutes a word meaning the opposite of what he intends. Benefactors for malefactors, detest for protest, cardinally for carnally, and so on. Though his outward presentation is flawed, he is inwardly virtuous, as his behavior demonstrates. In this, he is a foil for Angelo, whose outward behavior is supposedly spotless, while his inward thoughts are corrupt. 3. At Act 2, Scene 2, Lines 41-47, to Isabel, unfamiliar with the world of men, having asked once for mercy for her brother, is about to accept Angelo's first argument rejecting her plea and to depart. Oh, just but severe law! I had a brother then. Heaven keep your honor. As at first, in Act 1, Scene 4, again here it is Lucio who encourages her to keep the argument going. Give not or so, to him again, and so on, until Angelo begins to waver, though not in mercy but because of lust. That Isabel needs the prodding of Lucio is evidence of the simplicity and purity of her faith and of her humility. That Lucio should be the one doing the prodding fits with his being a representative of the principle of self-indulgent sexual depravity. He is energized to work for her success, as he says earlier to Claudio at Act 1, Scene 2, Lines 187 to 189, as well for the encouragement of the like, that is, of his own sexual indulgences, 
as for the enjoying of thy life. Isabel, Angelo, and Lucio here in Act 2, Scene 2, can be understood as a representation of the psychomachia, or inner moral warfare, about to take place within Angelo. Isabel represents virtue, Lucio the temptation to depravity. Angelo, who believes he is akin to Isabel, is so only on the outside. Inside, as he is about to find out about himself, he is a far more dangerous version of Lucio. 4. Also in Act 2, Scene 2, at lines 73 to 75, Isabel says, Why all the souls that were were forfeit once, and he that might the vantage best have took found out the remedy. She is referring to original sin in all men, and the sacrifice of Christ as God's remedy for it. That is, in strict justice all men would be condemned by God for the fall and the manifold sins following it, if it were not that in mercy God provided Christ as the vehicle of man's redemption. As Philip Thompson writes, Measure for Measure is an ordinary Christian story. 5. Also in Act 2, Scene 2, at lines 179 to 180, Angelo says in soliloquy, O cunning enemy that to catch a saint with saints dost bait thy hook. The enemy Angelo means is the devil, who, to catch him, is tempting him not with the body of Isabel, but with her virtue. He calls her a saint, as Lucio did, and it is her saintliness that tempts him to lust. A few lines earlier he asks himself, Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? And the answer is yes. But where Isabel in humility denied Lucio's implication of her saintliness, You do blaspheme the good in mocking me, she said, at Act 1, Scene 4, Line 38, Angelo is significantly claiming sainthood for himself. This piles the sin of pride on top of his sin of lust. That pride is reiterated two scenes later, in Act 2, Scene 4, at lines 9 to 10, when he says he takes pride in his own gravity, that is, his moral seriousness, spiritual weightiness, or the appearance of them, a line revealing that it is not morality itself but his reputation for it that Angelo values. 6. In Act 3, Scene 1, Lines 5 to 41, the Duke gives a long speech to Claudio beginning, Be absolute for death. That speech on the pains and evils that beset a human life are more in character for a classically educated Stoic than for the Franciscan friar that the Duke is pretending to be. But the purpose of the speech is to buck Claudio up with a dose of Stoicism, training him in the contempt of worldly life by which, according to the argument, death is made the less to be feared. It was Claudio's worldliness that tempted him to bed with Juliet before their marriage. To this weakness of character, the Duke applies the power of reason. And it seems to work upon Claudio until Isabel informs him that there would be a way, though an immoral one, to preserve his life. It is that ray of perverse hope that plunges Claudio into terror of death with visions of damnation, at lines 117 to 131. By that fear he becomes temporarily blind to the doctrine that Isabel entirely embraces, the doctrine that salvation, not damnation, awaits those who repent and die in faith. 7. At Act 4, Scene 1, Line 70 to 71, the Duke assures Mariana that to deceive and go to bed with Angelo in Isabel's place is no sin, since he is your husband on a pre-contract. The irony is that he is fostering exactly the same act for which Claudio and Juliet stand condemned. But the parallel is crafted intentionally to suggest that sin and virtue lie not in the act itself, but in the soul's free will. Claudio, inwardly committed to Juliet, rushed to consummate their marriage before the outward wedding. Angelo, outwardly committed to Mariana, rushed to escape from consummating their marriage before the wedding. Though they are apparently opposite in practice, 
Both choices are in reality equally sinful forms of self-indulgence. Claudio's sin was lust for his beloved and a weak lack of restraint. Angelo's sin was lust for lucre and a weak lack of fidelity. To pay his debt, Claudio must be separated from Juliet, at least for a time. To pay his debt, Angelo must be joined with Mariana, who still loves him. The Duke's plan is additionally justified in its effect on Angelo. Going to bed with Mariana, thinking that she was Isabel, did in fact satisfy Angelo's desire, and that satisfaction later proves to him that his lust for Isabel was an illusion. 8. At Act 5, Scene 1, Line 411, we get the line that gives the title to the play. Like doth quit like, and measure still for measure. It is a reference to Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, and the context of this verse in the Gospel, verses 1 through 5, sums up the theme of the play. Here's the Geneva Bible's translation. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why seest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how sayest thou to thy brother, Suffer me to cast out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Hypocrite, first cast out that beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. In the light of this passage, consider, for example, Aeschylus's attempt to get Angelo to see himself in Claudio. Let but your honor know whether you had not some time in your life erred in this point which now you censure him. That's Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 8 to 16. At Act 2, Scene 2, Line 64, Isabel says, If he had been as you and you as he, and at Line 75 to 77, how would you be if he, which is the top of judgment, that means God, should but judge you as you are? Of course, measure for measure is not the final word. In the last scene of the play, at line 498, the Duke, like Isabel, finds an apt remission in myself, and in the end tempers all his just measures with mercy. Now here are ten notes to particular lines to help you in your reading. 1. In Act 1, Scene 1, at line 7 to 9, there is an insoluble crux. Then no more remains but that, to your sufficiency, as your worth is able, and let them work. This sentence, as we have it in the folio text, the only early source for the play, makes no sense, and we conclude that there is at least one line missing from the text, possibly more than one, either after sufficiency or after Abel. Probably the missing passage was dropped by the typesetter. It is futile to try to make sense of the lines as they are, though some editors have tried to imagine the missing words. As is common in such cases, nothing the editors have come up with satisfies us as being Shakespearean. 2. In Act 1, Scene 2, lines 32, 33, and 34, the word piled means layered having a nap to the cloth, with a pun on pilled, meaning peeled, here stripped of hair, or bald. Baldness was one of the effects of the treatment for syphilis. 3. Act 1, Scene 2, Line 34. Do I speak feelingly now? Means, have I touched you in a sore spot? The next line puns with the implication that he is speaking with pain because of a syphilitic sore in the mouth. This leads to, I will learn to begin thy health, but forget to drink after thee, at lines 37 to 39, meaning, if there is only one cup between us, I will toast your health and drink from the cup before you drink from it, but not after you do, lest I become infected with your venereal disease. 4. In the same scene, Act 1, Scene 2, line 90 has the phrase, groping for trouts in a peculiar river. The sexual innuendo needs no note, but it helps to know not only that the word fish was slang for a woman, 
but that the word peculiar means privately owned, hence forbidden, illegal to be fished. 5. Still in the same scene, Act 1, Scene 2, lines 91 to 92, read, Is there a maid with child by him? No, but there's a woman with maid by him. A maid, meaning virgin, cannot be with child, meaning pregnant, because being pregnant she is no longer a virgin. But a woman, no longer a maid, is with maid, that is pregnant by him, with a pun picking up the fishing image from the earlier line on the word maid, which also means a young fish. 6. In note 1 I mention an insoluble crux, the missing lines in the third speech of the play. There is another such crux in this same Act 1, Scene 2 at line 168. Claudio observes that 19 zodiacs, meaning years, have gone round since the enrolled penalties of the law have been enforced. In the next scene, at line 21, the Duke says that he has let the strict laws of Vienna slide for this 14 years. Well, which is it, 19 or 14 years? It is possible that Claudio is exaggerating, and the Duke being precise about the number of years. It is more likely, however, that Shakespeare or the typesetter slipped up. But though we will never know which number Shakespeare really intended, we also know that it doesn't matter. The point is that it's been a long time that mercy has prevailed in Vienna in matters of sexual misbehavior. 7. At Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 5 to 6, the folio text has, Let us be keen and rather cut a little, than fall and bruise to death. The word fall is probably a typesetter's error. Some editors have tried to preserve it by interpretation, but perfect sense is made by emending to dull, which completes the antithesis with keen in the previous line. Keen and cut a little rather than dull and bruised to death. 8. At Act 2, Scene 4, lines 121 to 123, we find the following exchange. Angelo, we are all frail. Isabel, else let my brother die, if not a fettery, but only he owe and succeed thy weakness. Angelo voices the commonplace, we are all frail, meaning fallen, fallible. Isabel replies, if that were not so, then let my brother die. If there is no other person equally guilty of this sin, fettery means confederate in the sin. That is, if my brother were the only one to owe, meaning own, and succeed, meaning inherit from Adam's original sin, the weakness you speak of. There is an additional implication, unintended by Isabel but meant to be caught by us, that it is indeed Angelo's sin, too. 9. At Act 4, Scene 3, Line 100, which reads, By cold gradation and wheel-balanced form, most editors amend wheel to well. Cold implies calm reason as opposed to passion, and gradation careful steps rather than headlong rushing. If the word intended is indeed wheel, the duke means the balancing of personal desires with the requirements of state. In any case, the whole phrase implies the measured application of justice and alludes to the title of the play. 10. At Act 5, Scene 1, Line 524, the Duke says of Lucio's punishment, Slandering a prince deserves it. This assertion is to be taken seriously. Unlike in modern America, where the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution secures the right to freedom of speech, or has done until recently, in Shakespeare's hierarchical world, slandering a prince is a significant and heavily punishable offense. The Duke has in fact been merciful to Lucio, forgiving his slanders and remitting his other forfeits, that is, punishments, at line 519 to 520. But Lucio will nevertheless be made to marry the woman he has gotten with child for the sake of the woman, the child, and the commonwealth. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Shakespeare.